Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome and thanks for logging on. We're starting our weekend with watches and everything you see is for sale. Reach out to me directly. I am T Masso at thewatchbox.com with all of your purchase and pricing inquiries about these watches. We buy what we sell. We sell what we buy. We are always looking to build inventory. Sell us a watch. Trade us a watch. In fact, sell us an entire collection. We pay cash. We pay fast. We make the process easy. We guide you through it. No upper limit on value paid. We will buy your entire collection of vintage Patek leap to buy trade or sell t masso at the watchbox.com the rolex daytona was my dream watch once upon a time i loved auto racing and as a kid growing up in the late 1990s the rolex daytona was the watch i associated with my favorite motorsports events endurance sports car racing back then we had grand am and american le mans and the 24 hours of daytona was grand am the winners then and now won the Rolex Daytona, and on the podium, it looked to me like motorsport's greatest trophy. In fact, it is, as we've seen active Formula One drivers go to Daytona to win this watch. But what are you actually getting? Let's strip away the legend and look at it on the wrist. The reality of a recent Daytona, this is the 116-500LN, the 2022 model, is that it's a lot thinner than you might think, and it's anything but generic. Really, how many 40 millimeter, no date, full bracelet, automatic winding chronographs can you think of? There's not a lot on that list. It's low enough that it'll slide underneath the cuff, and yet 100 meters water resistant, hugely anti-magnetic and shock tolerant. It is also a very versatile and rugged watch. Three-day power reserve, automatic winding, chronometer certified, and of course you've got screw down crowns, first class column wheel feel, the smoothness of a vertical clutch, a ceramic tachymeter scale for using the chronograph to gauge speed, oyster bracelet, double locking oyster clasp. You can see we have a lift lock system with a beak and a hook. Then we also have a clamshell. And of course we have Rolex's easy link system in here, five millimeters in, five millimeters out, snaps shut, snaps open, tool free on the fly adjustment. And this is probably the most enduring modern Rolex design. The subs changed a ton over the last 40 years. Every single major watch from the GMT to the Datejust has changed immensely. Whereas the Daytona basically looks like the same watch it was in 1988. The most conspicuous change since then has just been the ceramic bezel, which arrived in 2016. This is my preference. I know there's also a white dial out there. I've always liked the all black look because visually, at least to my eye, the black bezel visually extends the dial, creating the appearance of a larger watch without actually creating a larger watch. And it wears well. I've seen women wear it convincingly. So this is a very versatile piece. That said, some people prefer to go a little bit far afield with their full bracelet steel sports watches, also 40 millimeters in stainless steel. This is a watch that came out in 2020, the Moser Streamliner Center Second. This is the discontinued matrix green dial. You can see that there is luminescence in the form of globalite ceramic based loom and the watch is just about 12 millimeters thick which makes it nice and slim on the wrist it's comparable to the daytona even if the sheer side makes it look thicker when moser created its integrated bracelet sports watch it wanted to pay homage to an era without plagiarizing specific watches from that era so while perhaps you can see a little bit of omega chronograph lobster tail ebel sport wave Maybe in the shape of the case, a little bit of late Mark series Speedmaster or Oris Chronoris Star. This is a watch that stands on its own as a unique effort, and it's beautiful. 120 meters water resistant with a screw down crown, automatic winding, a three day power reserve, that matrix green smoked fume dial. It's smaller than you think, being really compact, only about 45 millimeters from lug to lug. So even on my wrist, which is kind of smallish, this wears really well and it will fit underneath the cuff. These and the salmon dial follow ons have been highly sought, and I know that. Perpetually, these are the Moser watches about which we are most frequently asked. Turning it all over, you can see that the movement is accomplished and impressive. A real sports watch movement, designed fairly thick so it's not going to be shock susceptible. It features a Paul-based magic lever bidirectional winding with a ceramic 
ball bearing on the rotor. Full balance bridge, free sprung balance, three hertz beat rate. Most are making the bridges, plates, and the wheels, yes, but also the hairspring, the recessed bolt balance, and the escapement. Deeply impressive. A lot of full manufacturers will not lay claim to making their own assortments. Moser does. You can also see the rotor is good looking. Now, some Mosers today, sports watches, they feature tungsten rotors. Here we've got the rose gold, and we've got four different finishes, as you can see, beautifully detailed, like the movement itself. My favorite detail of the movement is Moser's unique double crested coat de Genève. You can see how they have a double ripple crest, really good looking stuff. And of course, the bracelet being intricately finished with its hollows and its recesses being polished to contrast with the satin. It has a very fluid feel on the wrist. It's one of the best bracelets available at any price on the market today. And that is the Streamliner Center Second Matrix Green. Now, a lot of folks would think that the alternative to that from Longa would be an Odysseus, but the Odysseus can be hard to come by, and frankly, it's not the ultimate Longa on a bracelet. Up your Longa game, at least your bracelet game, with this full platinum Longomatic Perpetual. The model launched in 2001, a combination of a three-quarter rotor automatic based on the Saxomat caliber, and a 38.5 millimeter platinum case. This one features the factory integrated bracelet, and you can see its intricacies with staggered link alignment, size, different planes, as you actually have several different depth points on the top of the bracelet, and then of course differential finish with satin and polish. This is outstanding, and you can see that the removable links here are fixed by screws. That is the right way to build an expensive watches bracelet. One quirk, of course, with a lot of platinum watches is that they feature white gold clasp internals because white gold is the hardest gold and much, much harder and thus stronger than platinum. It's always interesting, too, to see these clasp internals where they tend to be unplated traditional white gold, the kind that would normally be rhodium plated if it were a watch case. So if people ever want to know what white gold, traditional, not gray gold, but traditional white gold looks like unplated, it looks like the inside of a Longa platinum bracelet clasp or an F. Bjorn platinum bracelet clasp. Longa nameplate right there and on the dial. Well, the dial is actually quite impressive. The dial base is made of sterling silver and then it's galvanized this sort of matte gray. You can see that the watch, surprisingly for a dress timepiece, is fairly well loomed. You can read it in the dark, including sub-registers. We've also got hands as well as indices and the frame for the date made of gold. And then take a look at the seconds hand, pull the crown out. The Saxomat caliber zero resets the seconds, so it's easy to set against a reference time. Longa moon phase discs are always made of solid gold, in this case white gold. And they have a 122-year adjustment interval. The perpetual calendar here means the calendar system doesn't need to be adjusted until the year 2100. You can see that it's possible to adjust all of the indications in sync. So if you fall a few days behind, just like an IWC perpetual calendar, you can just quickly toggle and everything will move synchronized, including the moon phase. So it's very user-friendly. Flip it all over. You can see the movement resplendent in German silver. I have favorite details on these. You can see the finish is world class. You don't need me to tell you that. But one detail that always popped for me was the fact that the rotor is made of 21 karat gold and the mass is made of platinum. And frankly, this is the only double precious metal rotor of which I'm available and or of which I'm aware, I should say. It and which is available. But you can also see one of the cool features is that blued screws are used to fix the rotor to the mass. And then the rotor itself has at least three different types of finishing. We've got satination, we've got beveling, and then you can see we have a chiseled base within the recesses. Lots to love. You can see the ratchet wheel is black polished. We have solarization on the bridge below the rotor, of course, being a three-quarter rotor, kind of like a micro rotor. Everything's in the same plane as the other bridges, so you get the thin case band of a manual wind, the open display vista of a manual wind, and you get the convenience of an automatic. It's got a 46-hour power reserve, and it's truly special. You can see the longest famous freehand engraving on the balance cock, glossuta stripes, beveling, engine turning, black polish polish and the bridge is made of a nickel copper zinc alloy commonly known as German silver with the copper giving it that lovely golden hue. We're doing a round the world overview of luxury watches. We've been to Switzerland, we've been to Germany, and now we're going to Japan. We're going to Nagano Prefecture. This watch, made in the Micro Artist Studio in Shiojiri, is the Grand Seiko SBGD001, launched in 2016, the first Grand Seiko made in the Micro Artist Studio. Three mainspring barrels, eight days of power reserve. It is the spring drive eight day in black polished 
manually finished platinum. This watch, which is 43 millimeters to accommodate its awesome spring drive caliber 9R01, it's actually 100 meters water resistant. If you take a look at the dial, you can see the faceting of the hands and the indices. The facets are razor-like. The hands are completely mirror polished, and so are the indices. They twinkle like cut gems. They're finished by hand, placed by hand, and caulked onto the dial by hand. The second's hand is fired blue steel, and you can see it has a truly stepless, smooth glide. The spring drive system unique to Seiko and Grand Seiko, though Piaget had a run at it, not entirely successful. This remains a distinctive technology of the Seiko empire, and it took from 1977 to 1999 to bring spring drive to market with many patents, trials, errors, and prototypes. This gives you the accuracy of a quartz watch, but with the soul of mechanical watchmaking because there are no batteries, no stepper motors, no capacitors. The operation is by mainspring torque, three barrels, driving a unidirectional governing wheel, which creates an induced electrical current to power up a quartz oscillator. That, in turn, applies an electromagnetic braking force to slow down the governing wheel, and the governing wheel on one side is geared to the barrels, supplying the power. On its other side, it's geared to the drivetrain, driving the hands. We do have a hacking seconds function. In fact, I'll show you one of the subsidiary functions here. We have the ability to independently set the hour of the day without stopping the seconds hand. So this watch, which is accurate to between 10 and 15 seconds a month at worst, can be set quite precisely and kept there. You can also see in profile just how sharply faceted those indices and hands are. And on the reverse side, the image of Mount Fuji, a dominant feature of the Japanese landscape, the enormous mono bridge terminating in enormous bevels inspired by Philippe Dufour, set nation across, fired blued screws, the bell flower, the symbol of the micro artist studio, which only makes a few dozen examples of any given model per year, power reserve indicator with more lush beveling, eight days of course, and you can see that all the screw and jewel sinks have been internally beveled, a wonderful flourish that speaks to the attention and detail lavished throughout. We even have a full platinum clasp here. One of the quirky things here is that Grand Seiko figured out a way around the platinum clasp problem. A lot of companies in Switzerland, like FP Journe or in Germany, like Longa, will give you a white gold clasp with your platinum watch. Well, what they figured out at Seiko was that if you use PT900 for the delicate folding components, that's a lot harder than PT950. So by using a harder grade of platinum, they were able to make the full clasp here out of platinum rather than having white gold on platinum in a sort of hybrid assembly. This is a very cool watch. Accurate as a quartz, but soulful and lifetime serviceable like a mechanical. And if you're wondering what I meant about black polishing the case, I mean, at Grand Seiko, there's a tin plate polishing method that takes three years to learn, and the surface of the case to be milled is held directly against the spinning tin plate to create a mirrored, optically smooth finish. So that's what's going on right there. The next watch is quite important to me because De Betune is my favorite watch brand, and it long has been. And my dream came true a year ago when my company actually purchased Debitune, meaning I would have access to the factory and the newest models. And this is one of them. The kind of Debitune, frankly, that I would wear is I like traditional round cases, solid dials, and perpetual calendar complications. This is the DB25 Perpetual Calendar. It's launched in 2021 for the first time ever the model being made in a base metal, grade 5 titanium rather than precious metal. We have case, dial, and movement made by Debatune, and the reason they make these is because most suppliers, even in the Swiss watch industry, even for other Swiss, would not provide a few dozen examples or even just 10, 12, 15 examples of a case or a dial. They want hundreds or thousands of orders. So by controlling the whole fabrication process, Debatune can make five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten examples of a model per year, keeping quality high and volumes low. You can see the center is real reductive rose lathe guilloche with a rosette pattern. The hands, which are curved on miniature rolling pins, are polished. You can see we have a perpetual calendar, day, date, month, leap year phase, and a spherical moon. You can see it is actually a sphere. One half white palladium, one half oxidized black. All of this 44 millimeters in diameter, but under 13 millimeters thick. We'll throw it on my wrist so you can get a look at it. It has a matching factory calfskin and olive green textile strap for sort of a military or utilitarian look. 
On the wrist, this 44 wears well. Being flat, light, basically all sapphire and titanium, I could wear this. I think if your wrist is 16 centimeters circumference and up, you go with the 44. There's also a 40. If your wrist is smaller than mine, you go with the 40. It's that simple. On the reverse, we have a couple of different patents. This watch is protected by no fewer than six possibly quite a few more. So you can see the process of bluing the titanium. Everything you find on the back that's blue is fired titanium. We have one, two, three, four cantilevered shock protection springs for the rotor. So the rotor's lever arm can be made super long for efficient winding, but without creating the problem of torsion or torque across the bearing, because you have these four springs. That was patented in 2006, and you can see each spring features three inset synthetic rubies so that when the rotor comes in contact with the spring, the friction minimized. You have satination or snailing on the mass itself. All screw heads are black polished. On the barrel bridge, there's two barrels, five-day power reserve. You can see a combination of media blasting and satination. And then we have one, two, three shock protection springs with a beautifully satinated and beveled triple parachute outer shock protection bridge. The shock protection system here is to avoid fracturing the balance staff, but also to more rapidly recenter the balance staff pivot in its jewel, which improves timekeeping. By limiting the amount of time, the pivot is mobile out of its cup. The balance, patented in 2016, is blue titanium, and then the mass is outboard or white gold, reducing the effects of aerodynamic drag, but also the impact of temperature on the timing of the watch. Four hertz beat rate, no low rate tricks played to get that long five day power reserve. The hairspring, two elements clamped together after being shaped by hand to breathe concentrically like an overcoil, but give you the thinness and shock resistance of a flat hairspring. And though you can't see it in there, there is a silicon escape wheel of Denis Flageolet's own design. Denis is the watchmaking master and co-founder behind the brand, and they're making about 250 watches these days. Compare that to about 900 for FP Journe and 5,000 for Richard Meal, really probably 5,500 for Richard Meal. You get a real sense of just how scarce Debitune watches are. And this one, the Perpetual Calendar in titanium, is your everyday Debitune watch. While we're on a titanium kick, we may as well talk about something that was a breakthrough. Originally envisioned by Nicolas Dehon at Rolex in 1998, the Girard Perigo Constant Escapement LM was essentially abandoned by the folks in Geneva who attempted to create the Constant Force Escapement Array using a buckling blade made of metal. Well, the Constant Force system only works if you have the physical properties of silicon, which works as a perfect spring and can be shaped using deep reactive ion etching to be extraordinarily fine. And so we have, at fractions of the thickness of a human hair, a blade that's actually a monoblock with this surrounding iridescent silicon frame. That's all one piece. And so when Dehon left, Rolex, he went to Gerard Perigo, where he was able to realize the system using the silicon components because Rolex hadn't followed through with the patent. They never completed it. So we wound up with a couple of prototypes actually reaching the market via auction of the Rolex movement. It doesn't work, but you've got prototypes floating around. The functional version was realized by Gerard Perigo and brought to market as the Constant Escapement LM in 2013. It won the GPHG Aguido. And then in 2016, they came out with the version you see here, which, believe it or not, is the midsize. The original was 48 millimeters in titanium and rose gold. This one is 46 millimeters in grade 5 titanium. So when I throw it on my wrist, you can see that it actually is wearable. It's very light, being all titanium and sapphire. Taking a look, you can see it's big, but big is sort of the look. This caliber 9100 movement is enormous, and it fills the entirety of the case. The lugs are fairly short and tightly curved, so if your wrist is my size or larger, game on. Flipping it over, you can see that technically this is part of the Bridges collection. As we have the image of the Golden Bridge recapitulated several times, both on the dial and on the case back, it's a manual winder with two mainspring barrels, and a lot of people come to me claiming these are broken because they try to wind them in a conventional fashion. The only way to wind this watch is to wind it counterclockwise. you got to remember that. Impressively, despite the power-intensive escapement system, it still has a six-day power reserve, and you can really see how that movement pushes right out to the edge of this 46-millimeter case. Beveling, satination, and media blasting are to a high standard. We have black polish on the screw heads. We'll flip back to the dial side. You can see each one of these individual bridges is matted on its top, satinated on its top, and beveled on its side. We do actually have a little bit of loom, not a lot, but we have some. 
and you can see that the power reserve indicator is also loomed. The watch comes with a full matching titanium folding clasp, and the point of this elaborate system is constant force to the escapement. Each one of these cam wheels buckles the blade, so if you can imagine holding a playing card in your hand, and it's buckling back and forth as you press down and push on each side, it snaps back and forth. And that's how this works. So it's not the actual mainspring barrel that's driving the escapement. You can see that little rocker. That little rocker that goes back and forth impulses the balance. These two cam wheels just push the silicon blade until it buckles and snaps. And it's the energy stored in the blade and the snap of the blade that moves the rocker and impulses the balance. So every time the blade is induced to snap, it snaps with the same amount of force. That's how this watch, despite huge six days of power reserve from two mighty mainsprings, is able to achieve constant balance amplitude and outstanding chronometric precision for the full six rated days of its power reserve. That's how that works. In 2007, Erverk launched the UR201 with a new type of animated, revolving, and scrolling digital time display. Well, in 2008, one year later, it launched this, the UR202, which is the 201 with some upgrades. First, it is the same display we know and love. Take a look at the index. Let's watch as we approach 2, 11, 8. You can see that the numeral for the incoming hour rolls into position, and then this little needle index actually traces precisely the contours of the minute scale. And if you want to know what time it is, it is 8. 45. Now it's 850. Now it is 910. Just like that. There's a day-night scale to right. There's a moon phase display to left. You can see the carousel, much like an Audemars Piguet star wheel in theory, but far more intricate in its operation, especially with this cam-based index that moves in and out and the tumbling individual carousel arms. The whole thing's made of white gold. It's 44 millimeters wide, and it's approximately 48 millimeters from the tip of the case on one side to the back of the crown on the other. Now, there's a little lock system here. You unlock, and then you pull the crown out, and when you're done adjusting, you push the lock back into place, and a little cam lobe returns the crown to its seated position. It's white gold, with the exception of the case back, which is titanium. And the big difference between the 201 and the 202 is this. There's a Zenith Elite automatic base with Erverk's own complication module. And then on the back, they've made changes to the winding system. So the way this works is you have airways, and then you have air turbines. And by cutting off the flow of air through the turbine, you can slow down the winding. So if you're super sedentary and you work in an office like me, you just leave the system fully open. You can see that the air passages are open so that the turbines can ingest as much air as they want and it winds vigorously. Now let's say you're an active person. You're engaged in that active lifestyle that involves your Range Rover and your big dog and your country club and your boat. Well, this is the intermediate position. You can see now we're starting to close off some of the airways and slow down the winding to limit the wear and tear on the winding system. Now, let's say you're that really extreme athlete. You're, you're some sort of sponsored pro athlete wearing a high-end independent watch at a major international competition. Now, you lock the winding system. You go to stop. And you can see how it's closed off the airways. No air can flow through the turbines. I can also open it up. I can close it. I can open it up. And it has little colored stoppers so that you can actually see how much airflow is proceeding. Very cool stuff. And that is the UR202. Now we'll throw it on my wrist. The watch does have a proprietary strap. It's a weighty thing in spite of its large expanse of sapphire and its case back in titanium. On the wrist, the watch lives up to its nickname, the Hammerhead, and you can see why that is. It's not excessively thick, nor is it huge across the wrist. I could recommend it for a wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference, but it is weighty. You never forget that it's there. To a lot of folks, that's reassuring when paying for a very expensive watch. Made from 2004 to the very beginning of 2011, the Patek Philippe 5970 was the last of the Le based perpetual calendar chronographs at Patek Philippe. This is the 5970G. All told, somewhere between 2600 and 2800 5970s were made. It's mechanically identical to the 3970, but it's got a 40 millimeter case, which wears better on contemporary wrists. A lot of folks prefer to have 
what would best be described as a full size, not an oversized watch these days. You can see the case complex in its contours from the concave bezel down to the steps of the lugs. The watch features a number of pusher correctors as well as vintage inspired rectangular chronograph pushers. This watch has a matching full white gold deploying clasp. So you've got a case of white gold, a clasp of white gold, and then you've got a watch that is the gold standard for perpetual calendar chronographs as it has a lineage dating all the way back to 1941 and the original 1518. Taking a look on the wrist, you can see we have blackened hands, blackened indices. They're made of white gold, but they've been blackened. Perpetual calendar, no adjustments necessary until the year 2100, a 122 year moon phase, and a column wheel feel that is world class because it is based on the Lemania 2310 Bausch. You can see a big slow beating balance, 18,000 vibrations per hour, Geneva hallmark, six position adjustment, 24 joules, a big upgrade over a standard Lemania 2310 first, free sprung with a gyromax style balance, overcoil hairspring rather than flat, Geneva hallmark finish rather than raw, six position adjustment rather than unadjusted, and the power reserve for the Lemania is raised from 48 hours on the standard movement to 60 here. You can see the lateral clutch and the column wheel in action. As per Geneva tradition, the column wheel is capped. The finish is world class, and normally I would wax eloquent about this, but you could probably just see it and recognize what makes this watch so special. And 40 millimeters is a good size for a man and also still viable for a woman. If you're a lady, don't rule out the 5970. You might have your heart set on a 3970, but try this first. They're super short across the wrist at only about 47 millimeters, which means a smaller wrist can absolutely wear this watch, and it is low enough to fit under a cuff, as a Patek should be. Finally, we have something super rare and made specifically for the 2022 model year in only 10 pieces from H. Moser and C. This is the Endeavor Perpetual Tantalum, and it's a spectacular green jade dial, hand cut and finished for this Moser application. So we have the Andreas Streller Perpetual Calendar System, seven day power reserve, 42 millimeter tantalum case, and a jade dial. This one, as you can see on the reverse side, let's get a little bit closer here. Da, 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 da. Features the leap year indicator on the reverse side. We have pivot jewels, or I should say arbors, for the barrel set in golden chaton. And right down from the barrel arbors through the drivetrain, you can see golden chaton cups fixed by black polished screws are used to hold the drivetrain in place just as they would have been during the pocket watch era. We have Moser's distinctive double crested Cote de Genève. And note that on this example, we have both a diamond capstone. You can see that the capstone underneath the shock protection is a genuine diamond. The rubies are synthetic, the diamond is real. You can also see we have two flat hairsprings horizontally opposed. Moser makes the balance wheel, the hairsprings, and the escapement, and by the way, the escapement here is low friction 14 karat gold, but it's the twin horizontally opposed hairsprings that Moser generally reserves for tourbillon regulators and very special limited editions. And so by having these two identical hairsprings 180 degrees apart, when due to the angle of the watch, one is inclined to run fast, well, the other one will, by an equal and opposite margin, slow down the watch. This being an endeavor, you can see just how complex the contour of the case is. The case back itself is curved to hug the contour of the wrist. The case back, the crown, and the buckle are stainless steel. So this watch was designed as a super subtle two-tone, and you can see it best when you compare the case band to the crown. This is the Andreas Striller Perpetual Calendar System built on a Moser seven-day manual wind movement. In fact, it'll run for almost nine days, but they under-promise and over-deliver at Moser. Now you have a little stub index in the middle. See how this is a bi-directional perpetual? I can set it in either direction. And yes, the watch does feature hacking seconds, so I can stop it and synchronize to a second. Now watch what happens. Let me get that minute hand out of the way. As I adjust the watch backward, that little stub index will jump between the months. 12 hours, 12 months. So you can see I'm able to jump between months by turning the calendar forward and backwards, and it's that simple. One of the very few bi-directional perpetual calendars in the industry, one of the few you can't damage by setting in the middle of the night, and one of the few that will not need to go back to the manufacturer in the year 2100. It is an ingenious system in a watch to die for. You can see it's relatively short across the wrist, though 42 millimeters is a large case. The watch fits spectacularly, and being one of only 10, I can guarantee you, short of 
of working at Watchbox, you're never going to see another. If you love this watch or any watch you've seen in today's program, please reach out to me. I am T. Mosso at thewatchbox.com for all of your purchase and pricing questions.